Before we begin talking about four vectors, let's start from the very basics and talk about what a scalar is, at least in the context of special relativity. A scalar is a quantity that's specified by one component, a single number, and that single number does not change under a Lorentz transformation. What that means is that regardless of the inertial reference frame I'm in where I measure that scalar quantity, the measurement of that scalar quantity will not change. I'm sometimes going to use the term Lorentz scalar to describe such a scalar quantity because it's a more precise term in the sense that it specifically describes a scalar as something that doesn't change, that is invariant with respect to a Lorentz transformation. Let me give some classic examples of Lorentz scalars, one of which is the electrical charge of a particle. If I've got a particle whose charge is equal to that of one electron, so approximately 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, then an observer that is at rest with respect to that particle will measure that particle's charge as one electron, obviously. In addition, an observer who's moving at, say, a constant velocity v to the right will also measure the same charge in his reference frame. There's no reason for a particle's charge to somehow change if it's being measured in a different inertial reference frame. Another classical example of a Lorentz scalar is the space-time distance, or the space-time interval f squared. Recall that the space-time interval between two events a and b is given by the negative of the speed of light c times the time separation delta t between a and b, all of that squared plus the sum of squares of the spatial separations in the x, y, and z directions. Let's again suppose I have two inertial reference frames. My first reference frame R has an observer like so and is going in this direction. My second reference frame R prime has this observer and is going in the other direction with a different constant velocity. Now even though both observers might disagree on the exact value of delta t between the two events or on the individual values of delta x, delta y, or delta z, both of them will still measure the exact same s squared between events a and b. We've talked about this extensively in previous videos, how the space-time interval is invariant under a Lorentz transformation. This fact purely arises from the postulates of special relativity and the Lorentz transformation. So anyway, because the space-time interval is the same between two events regardless of the inertial reference frame used to view those two events, the space-time interval is therefore a Lorentz scalar. Let's now take a few minutes to talk about time. In classical mechanics, time was a scalar quantity. That meant that if you wanted to measure the time delta t between two events in classical mechanics, then you'd measure the same time interval between those events regardless of the reference frame you were observing those events from. In special relativity though, you have to deal with time dilation, which means that the time interval observed between two events is not the same in every inertial reference frame that is used to observe those two events. This should also make sense if you go back and look at the space-time interval equation. The space-time interval must be a scalar, it must be measured the same between two events regardless of inertial reference frame. However, the individual components of the space-time interval, so the delta t, delta x, etc., can still change from one reference frame to another, and because of that, even though s squared is guaranteed to be a Lorentz scalar, delta t is not guaranteed to be a Lorentz scalar because it changes depending on the inertial reference frame used to measure it. So even though time is a scalar in classical mechanics, it's not a scalar in special relativity because it varies with the Lorentz transformation. Now, if time isn't a scalar in special relativity, then we've got a problem, because if we want to take the derivatives with respect to time to get things like velocity, acceleration, etc., then we need those derivatives to be with respect to a scalar, because otherwise we won't have a proper Lorentz vector in the end. I'll get to what a Lorentz vector or four vector means in a future video, but the point behind my argument here is that we want a time quantity that is invariant with Lorentz transformations. We want a time that serves as a Lorentz scalar. Worry not though, because there actually is a time quantity that serves as a Lorentz scalar, and that time quantity is the proper time interval. Now I'm going to spend the next few moments giving a precise but intuitive definition of the proper time interval. A good and intuitive way to think of proper time is to think of it as one position time. What do I mean by that? Well, suppose I draw a space-time diagram with x as my only spatial dimension. x is measured in meters while time is measured in light meters, so the time it takes for light to travel one meter. The light line, like always, which represents the path of light in space-time, is then given by this 45 degree straight line in yellow. The axes on the space-time diagram represent the position and time of events observed according to some default unprimed inertial reference frame, which I'll call R. Let's suppose now that I have two events, which again I'll call A and B, with A at the origin of the space-time diagram and B somewhere here inside the light line. 
Recall from a few videos back that because B is inside the light line, the time separation, the vertical separation between A and B, is larger than the spatial or horizontal separation between A and B. What does this mean about the nature of the events A and B? Well, it means that they're time-like separated because the time separation dominates. So if A and B are time-like separated, that means the space-time interval S squared between A and B is negative based on the equation for the space-time interval that I've written here. Again, the deltas between Y and Z are zero here because we're only considering one spatial dimension. Now, because my space-time interval is negative between A and B, it is then possible for me to construct an inertial reference frame R prime, where the delta x between A and B becomes zero. And that's because the only thing that really needs to stay consistent between different inertial reference frames is the space-time interval. I've said this before, the individual delta t and delta x can be almost anything, as long as the f squared remains the same negative number between different inertial reference frames. And in this reference frame R prime, where the delta x prime between A and B is zero, the only non-zero separation that exists between the events A and B is the time separation. The spatial separation is zero. In fact, if you draw the t prime and x prime axes on our original space-time diagram, then this is what those t prime and x prime axes will look like according to someone in the reference frame R. So because the spatial separation between A and B is zero in the R prime reference frame, the only separation that exists between A and B in this reference frame is the time separation. And this is where the definition of proper time comes in. The proper time interval tau between A and B is the time separation between time-like separated events A and B in the reference frame where the spatial separations between A and B is zero. And this is also why the proper time interval is called the one position time. It's the time interval between two events in a reference frame where the two events appear to happen at the same position, at one position. Now, how do we calculate this proper time? Well, let's go back to our time-like separated events A and B again. The space-time interval between A and B is S squared, and this remains the same regardless of inertial reference frame. S squared is a Lorentz scalar, so it's the same in the unprimed reference frame and the primed reference frame. Now, by the definition I just wrote, the proper time interval is the time separation between A and B as judged in the reference frame where A and B occur at the same position, where the spatial separation between A and B is zero. So in this expression for the space-time interval, the proper time interval is the delta t that you get when the delta x, delta y, and delta z between A and B are all zero. So what we'll do is that in order to isolate our tau, our proper time interval, we'll cancel these delta x's, y's, and z's, move the negative sign to the left, take the square root, and then divide by the speed of light c. And when we do all of these steps, we find that the proper time interval between A and B is the square root of the negative space-time interval divided by the speed of light c. I'll call this equation 1. I want to note a couple of things about proper time. The first is that it's a Lorentz scalar, which is exactly what we want. Why is that? Well, it consists of two quantities, the space-time interval, which is a Lorentz scalar, and the speed of light c. By the second postulate of special relativity, the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all inertial reference frames, so by definition, the speed of light is also a Lorentz scalar. And since the proper time is one scalar divided by another, the proper time itself is then also a Lorentz scalar. A scalar divided by a scalar gives you another scalar. Hopefully that should make sense. The second thing I want to note about proper time is that it only makes sense to talk about proper time between time-like separated events. Why is that? Well, because if I have two light-like separated events, then their space-time interval s squared is zero, which means that by equation one, the proper time between those events is also zero. And for space-like separated events, the space-time interval is positive, but when you take the negative of a positive number and then the square root of that, you end up with an imaginary proper time, which doesn't make any sense. The other thing about space-like separated events is that depending on the inertial reference frame being used to observe those two events, those events can become simultaneous in that reference frame. That's the relativity of simultaneity after all that I've talked about previously. And that's why it makes no sense to talk about the proper time between space-like separated events. I'm now going to end this video by talking about how we can calculate the proper time for some particle with a random world line that might curve in all sorts of directions until it goes from its start point A at the origin of our space-time diagram to its end point B. A might represent the event where the particle begins at the start line, and B might represent the event the particle crosses the finish line. 
I've only drawn one spatial dimension here for ease of depiction, but you can imagine the scenario happening in all three spatial dimensions. The same argument will still apply. If I want to find the distance this particle travels in space-time from A to B, then what I can do is zoom in really closely on some random segment of this curve. When I zoom in really closely, it looks like in this infinitesimal section of the whirl line, the particle is traveling at a constant velocity because the whirl line looks like a straight line. And because the particle's traveling in a constant velocity in this infinitesimal section of the whirl line, the reference frame of the particle is basically an inertial reference frame, so the rules of special relativity apply in this really small section. This means that the infinitesimal space-time interval vs squared is given by the negative squared of the infinitesimal time separation cdt plus the sum of squares of the infinitesimal spatial separations dx, dy, and dz. Really, all we've done here is take the equation of the space-time interval s squared, and instead of larger finite deltas for the t's and the spatial coordinates, I'm using the infinitely small versions of those deltas, so dt, dx, dy, and dz. I'll call this equation 2. Now, if this world line represents the motion of a particle, then every one of these infinitesimal segments that make up the world line, every one of these segments needs to represent pairs of events that are time-like separated. Mathematically, this means that every single ds squared needs to be negative along this world line. That's because if I had some random positive ds squared segment in this curve, then that curve cannot represent the motion of the particle because there would be no causal link between the particle at the beginning of that segment and the particle at the end of that segment. Remember, spaced-like separated events cannot be causal. We've talked about this in a previous video. So now we've established that every ds squared segment represents a time-like separation on the world line of a particle. That means I can meaningfully calculate a proper time for the particle's motion on its world line. The proper time interval d tau for this infinitesimally small segment on the world line would then be the square root of the negative of ds squared divided by c. This is straight from equation 1, except I'm using differentials now. If I now use equation 2 to plug in my ds squared, this is what I get. And then if I want to find the total proper time taken by my particle to get from event A to event B, then I can just perform an infinite sum of these d taus. And how do I do that? Well, I integrate. So I can integrate from A to B of 1 over C times the square root term to get my overall proper time interval between A and B. Now, this integral basically represents the length of my world line in four-dimensional space-time. It's very similar to three-dimensional Euclidean space. In three-dimensional Euclidean space, you got your arc length by integrating the ds from the starting point to the ending point of the curve. Your ds by the Pythagorean theorem was just the square root of the sum of dx, dy, and dz squared. It's a very similar idea when we calculate the arc length in four-dimensional space-time, except now what you're integrating also involves time as the fourth dimension. But the important thing here is that the proper time interval basically gives you the arc length of the corresponding time-like world line, scaled by the speed of light, of course. So just by calculating the arc length of a time-like world line between two events in four-dimensional space-time, you can easily obtain the proper time interval taken by a particle to travel between those two events. And that's why the proper time interval is so important. It is directly related to the arc length in four-dimensional space-time. And if you've seen my differential geometry series, you'll know that we love to parametrize curves with respect to arc length because that makes our calculations and equations much simpler. The geodesic equation is a good example. That's why in relativity we'll be using the proper time pretty often because it simplifies things, especially when it comes to the more curved hypersurfaces that show up in general relativity, but you don't have to worry about those hypersurfaces right now. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.